We're pleased to welcome you to the AUSA Noon Report, our virtual series featuring senior Army leaders providing important updates on key defense topics. Our host today is AUSA's Vice President for Education, Lieutenant General Guy Swan, U.S. Army retired. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Association of the United States Army's Noon Report. We're very glad you've joined us today and appreciate your continued support for our many programs and events. I'd like to give a special thank you to our sponsor today, Vectris. Vectris has been an AUSA national partner since 2014 and is a leading provider of global service solutions in the areas of information technology, network communication services, facilities management, and logistics. Many of you know our speaker today, but uh, for those that don't, I'd like to give you a brief introduction to our guest. Lieutenant General Jim Pascaret assumed the duties as the Deputy Chief of Staff G8 in August of 2018 with primary responsibilities for programming and budgeting for the total Army. He's held several general officer positions, including Commanding General U.S. Army Japan, Deputy Commanding General U.S. Army Pacific, Deputy Director Program Analysis and Evaluation in G8, and Deputy Commanding General 4th Infantry Division during Operation New Dawn in Iraq. General Pascaret is a career armor officer having commanded the 2nd Battalion 12th Cavalry and the first Cav in the 1st Cav Division and the 1st Brigade of the 4th Infantry Division. He received his bachelor's degree and commission upon graduation from Furman University and holds master's degrees from Harvard University, the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, and the Army War College. He and his wife, Liz, have three sons, two of whom are serving in the United States Army. And for more information on his many awards and decorations and accomplishments, you can access General Pascaret's bio at the handout tab in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. If you have questions for General Pascaret today, and I'm sure there will be many, please use the Q&A tab and post your question in the box at the lower right side of your screen. General Pascaret's going to come up and make some remarks before addressing your questions, and our good friend Lieutenant Colonel Ewing will be lining up your questions and we'll do our best to get to as many of those as possible in the time that we have. So please start thinking about the questions you want to ask General Pascaret. And with that, Jim, thank you for your time and sharing uh, your thoughts with us today. And the floor is yours. Well, thanks, uh, that Guy, for the uh, introduction. And it is a uh, good afternoon to everybody here. Uh, maybe afternoon it might be the right, not the right salutation for everybody, depending on where you're at but I'm glad we can do this remotely in these unusual times. It is my pleasure to be here again at AUSA. As Guy mentioned, this is my third opportunity here to uh, speak in this room about where we stand from a resource perspective uh, in the United States Army. Uh, like everything COVID, this is a different year. I'm doing this in November instead of September like I normally have, and it's virtual instead of in this room ha having breakfast with a bunch of my uh, friends. But that said, I'm glad we were able to figure this out uh, because there is a lot to talk about. It has been a little bit over two years since I became the G8. Um, and I'd been in the, the first time I spoke, I had been in the position for a total of eight days uh, when I addressed AUSA here for breakfast. And I said at that time, I was speaking with the confidence of someone who has no idea what they were doing. Now it's been a little bit over two late days or two years later, and I still have days in G8 where I feel like I'm the dumbest guy in the room just because I'm surrounded by such high quality, smart analysts. But those days get are farther and farther in between as I serve in this capacity. But I hope uh, I'll get through these remarks and then I look forward to some Q&A uh, at the end. Before I get into my remarks here, though, I want to wish everyone out there a belated happy Veterans Day. A good bit of you, I imagine, have served in uniform in the past or are serving in uniform. Uh, so thank you for your service and support to the nation. One of those veterans is Guy Swan, off to my right. Guy, thanks for hosting today's event and allowing AUSA uh, uh, the opportunity for me again to speak. Guy has always been a pleasure to work with throughout the years. 
And I want to congratulate Guy and AUSA, and Pat McQuiston's here too, and she had a lot to do with AUSA, for pulling off the annual conference in October in the COVID environment. Personally, I thought it was a success given the restrictions that were in place. I met with about 30 industry partners over those three days and found the engagements more effective, frankly, than what I've done on the floor in the, at the convention center in the past. I also liked having Columbus Day off, so that's something to think about maybe in the future. Uh, I do have my Uncle Mike out there, I think, tuned in as a veteran here, too. So, Mike, thanks for your service. And finally, as Guy said, I, I want to thank Vectris uh, for sponsoring the uh, noon report today. Thanks for your continued support. So the year 2020 has been a challenge, to say the least. Uh, it started on New Year's Eve uh, when we, the 1st Brigade of the 82nd Airborne Division was alerted and deployed no notice to Iraq in response to the strike on Soleimani. Since then, it's been a wild roller coaster ride. Later that month, we got those first reports that, uh, that were, they started filtering out on something called no, novel coronavirus. And since mid-March, the G8 and the Army staff, and really the whole Army, we've worked with a fraction, at least inside the Pentagon, I should say, uh, at, the, at the ready, at their workstations. Most have been teleworking, even today. By and large, I'm very proud of my team, the G8, uh, we've continued to, we have over 500 soldiers, civilians, and uh, contractors that work in G8, we, and we've only had one or so uh, that's actually contracted the virus. We've managed to keep all the work that's important for to support our leadership's decisions uh, on pace uh, in this condition. So thanks to the G8 folks out there. Many of you that are tuned in here today uh, have been affected more than most by the downstream effects of the pandemic. The sharp economic downturn and the corresponding spike in unemployment, these are things I'm talking about. Then Congress's uh, and the president's action to provide relief to Americans that were in need with the outlay of over $3 trillion. That which, you know, had it created havoc with the indicators that, for, indicators that forecasters rely upon to predict the future of the U.S. economy and the financial institutions. All that was that downstream effect that I was talking about. In late May, just as we were adjusting to COVID-19, the nation was shocked by the Flo George Floyd incident and the reaction to his death. We added social unrest to the lockdowns and economic distress. And as an army, we took this as an opportunity to ass assess where we stand with regard to institutional racism. And we listened to how our soldiers and uh, civilians feel about the army based on their personal experiences. I conducted, like a lot of other senior leaders around the Army, a listening session with several of the G8 workforce of color. And it caused me to question some of my thoughts and assumptions about the Army that I've served in for a long time. The Army's embarked on a path to address diversity, equity, and inclusion, with the goal of ensuring everyone feels they are treated equally and have the same opportunity to succeed, regardless of sex, race, creed, religion, sexual preference, or whatever those other qualifiers out there that make us different as human beings. You can get away with a lack of diversity in the smooth sailing good times, but in times of adversity, when it matters most, organizations that lack diversity in both personal constitution and thought struggle to deal with the sticky problems as they see uh, just a single solution to the multifaceted and wicked problem that's before them. Besides that, it's simply just the right thing to do, to take this problem on head on. The fact is that institutional discrimination exists in the Army, just as it does in our society, and we are committed to eliminating it. It won't happen overnight, but in order to complete a marathon, you must first commit to running the race and take those first few steps, and that's what we've done. All of this friction, that unforeseen surge of forces at the beginning of the new year, the COVID emergence, societal unrest, the economic turndown. All this was, of course, in the midst of an election year and all that goes along with that. I won't talk much about that except to say how proud I am and how the Army has reacted or has acted, just like we always have done with our heads down and clear of the politics. So with this, it has been a tough uh, 10 and a half months for the citizens of the United States since the beginning of this year. But the Army has shouldered the burden and in many ways has fled the way in reaction to the myriad crises and support 
of the American people. Whether it was the Army Corps of Engineers and Army Medical Command providing emergency medical uh, facilities and assistance areas uh, uh, to those citizens that were stressed uh, with uh, COVID patients. The Army National Guard responding to a host of natural disasters, both hurricanes and fires out west. The Army National Guard providing support to civil authority uh, in areas that had civil disturbances. Or if you watch 60 Minutes a couple of week, weeks ago, General Perna and a cadre of Army officers and civilians supporting Operation Warp Speed's objective of developing and deploying a, a COVID vaccine. It was our Army that once again answered the nation's call when it mattered most. And candidly, it was no big deal. It's what the Army does. We respond to a crisis with cool heads, concentrated determination, and a laser focus on mission accomplishment. I've seen it my entire career and at what makes our Army the best in the world. So while all this was going on in 2020, the Army has been pressing forward on a path toward transformational modernization. We did not uh, make the journey alone, for we have committed partners on this journey. Congress has continued to provide the Army with the authorities and resources to develop the next generation of warfighting equipment. And industry has continued to partner with the Army in developing the equipment our soldiers need in the future. So with all that as an extended lead-in, I'd like to review where we've been, where we are today, and where I think we're gonna go in the future to modernize the Army's equipment portfolio in support of the strategic guidance. So back in September of 18, when I became the G8, several things were already underway that had been announced within the last year before I became, got in this seat. First, the Army Secretary in Chief rolled out the six modernization priorities in October of 17 along with the eight cross-functional teams that would be led by general officers. And this was the first big step in the modernization effort. In March of 2018, then the Secretary of the Army announced the Army's intent to establish Army Futures Command, a new four-star led organization that would solely focus on pulling the Army into the future. The CFTs would, were to be folded under AFC once they were established. And then May and June of that year of 2018, the SEC Army and the Chief of Staff of the Army personally oversaw the first deep dive, or night court, you may know it by those terms, of over 600 programs in the equipping portfolio. That effort moved about $17 billion across the program years within the equipping portfolio and moved them all into the CFT efforts overseen by those general officers. And we did that by eliminating or reducing over 180 legacy programs. We squeezed another 13 billion uh, of, of efficiencies from across the Army enterprise outside of the equipping portfolio and also moved those dollars against those cross-functional teams. So all told, about $30 billion were moved in Palm 2024, back in 2018, if you know how we, the timing on things, that served a jump start the next generation modernization, modernization effort inside the United States Army. In addition to the increase in the modernization accounts, the Army also resourced a slow, steady increase in end strength. And under General Milley's direction, we continued to make readiness number one by fully resourcing our readiness accounts to increase the Army's ability to fight tonight. As the Army's budget submission went through Congress, a vast majority of what was request, requested was supported in the appropriation. Of those 186 programs tagged for elimination or, or reduction, there were only one or two that sparked significant pushback on the Hill. In short, it was a good year for the United States Army. We received the resources we thought we needed to grow the Army, increase the readiness of the Army, and invest in the future readiness of the United States Army. In 2019, we doubled down on modernization in Palm 21-25. AFC was up and running at that point, and Dr. Jetty, along with General Murray, Dr. Jetty, the acquisition executive, they were empowered for this program to oversee the vast majority of the programmatic decisions that were made the year before by the secretary and the chief. We embarked on a second deep dive with established targets to seek resources to support the CFT requirements. And we hit them by eliminating or reducing another 80 programs 
moving over $9.1 billion against the CFT managed efforts. As you know, this request sits right now up on the Hill. We are in the midst of reviewing the recently released SACD marks and comparing them to the HACD marks that were out a month or two ago to assess a range, the range of possibilities we'll see in an appropriation. In fact, just this morning, I was with Thomas Horlander uh, from FMNC, and he oversaw an engagement with both the HACD and SACD staffers uh, talking about those marks. At this point in the process, we feel pretty good on where we're at, but we know there still is a long way to go with the normal uncertainty that has emerged with a pending change of administrations. Currently, in first quarter of 21, as we all know, we're operating under a continuing resolution, and we have 26 new starts and production increases that are hung up awaiting that appropriation. In 2020, we tackled POM 2226 along the same lines as the previous two programs. Our strategic guidance was the same under a new SEC Army and a Chief of Staff. Continue to fully fund and resource the requirements of the C CFTs and accept risk, fine dollars, and legacy programs. After two deep, deep dives, I thought it was going to be more challenging to find those efficiencies, and I was right. It was harder. But at the same time, the CFT requirements were not as significant as given, given they were well-resourced in the previous two POM builds or programs. We conducted a deep dive three last winter and spring under COVID conditions, and we found more for resources that we moved against the CFTs through the elimination and reductions of dozens of more programs. I can't talk about the details given that is uh, sitting inside the Department of Defense right now, but you'll see that at rollout when it happens, and I'll be prepared to talk any details at that time, along with my good friends from ASALT. One modification uh, to building this program was the establishment of what I call priority, a priority two bin of programs, and I'll just describe that uh, quickly. Priority one is the CFTs I've been talking about. Our senior leadership often talks to them, describes them as the 31 plus four, those next generation capabilities that we're developing. Priority two are what we call key enablers. Those are non-CFT programs that are directly tied to the success of a CFT effort. The example I often use is the Q53 uh, counterfire radar. Currently, the system cannot sense out to 70 kilometers, but we're developing an artillery system that will shoot that far with IRCA. So we're investing in developing an extended range Q53 radar to complement the IRCA system. It's common sense, but the key enabler concept was scattershod prior to this program build. Some complementary non-CFT programs were on schedule to deliver in coordination with the CFT program and others were not. It's like buying a brand new 2020 Corvette to replace the Chevy Citation you've been driving for 40 years. It came out in 1979. It would be a next generation upgrade but when you open the hood of the Corvette, it has a citation engine inside of it. We focused on resourcing those key enablers to deliver at the same time as a CFT program they would support so that the Corvette has a high powered engine in it when it delivered. I looked at the numbers the other day, and this is uh, eye opening too. And in this program, we have about almost just shy of 50% of the dollars in the equipping portfolio aligned against the CFT effort and the associated key enablers. Under the money talks, BS walks uh, saying, this is the clearest evidence that our Army's leadership's commitment is to modernizing the US Army. So we have completed program review on POM 22 with OSD, and we're in the midst of, in the midst of budget review right now. I can't, again, talk about details where we stand. I think we did very well in program review. It was the third year in a row of a consistent priorities, a consistent message, and in consonance with strategic guidance. Again, the natural uncertainty that uh, aligns with administration changes out there. So time will tell where we end up as this budget and program move through the process. So given the consistencies of priorities and thanks to the support of Congress in the 20 appropriation, where does the Army stand today? I th we're on the path to deliver next generation capabilities our soldiers require and if necessary, fight and win against near peer adversaries in the future. 
So I'll go through some of the examples here that we've been talking about for a year and give us an update on where we stand. I'll start with the number one priority, our long range fires portfolio. RICTO, or, or the Army Rapid Capability and Critical Technology Office, led by Lieutenant General Neil Thurgood, they're on glide path to deliver the long range hypersonic weapon. Back in March, you might have seen a DOD release that announced a joint Army Navy uh, test shot of a hypersonic uh, weapon, uh, a test shot of a, a missile. It flew a long way and very fast. I'm not allowed to tell the, talk the details I was told, but it hit within seven inches of what it was shooting at after a long and fast flight. And Neil and his team are going to deliver to the Army a prototype battery of hypersonics in FY23. Our leadership has talked a lot recently about what we call a mid-range capability. We'll be begin delivering land-based batteries of uh, Tomahawk and SM6 missiles that can strike maritime and land targets at range, beginning in FY23. That IRCA, the Extended Range Cannon Artillery I talked about, is on schedule to deliver in FY23. The system will have a range of at least 70 kilometers, and we are developing a follow-on variant with an autoloader. Under the next-gen combat vehicle CFT, the Army has deci decided at the beginning of the year to reset the optionally manned fighting vehicle program. Now, I think one of my predecessors is out there, Bob Lennox, and he gave me the business about that decision at the time. But our leadership made that decision to ensure we get the requirements right on this program on the front end of development. The Army is committed to OMFV as the Bradley replacement. In July of 2020, just a few months ago, we, we released, released the draft uh, request for proposal with the goal of gaining industry feedback. And the CFT and the PEO uh, are on track to release the request for proposal uh, next month. So um, we are on track to field this uh, to our ABCTs now, we believe in 2028. Under robotics, we're fielding several small unmanned aerial systems, aircraft systems, and smaller ground robots. We recently demonstrated uh, uh, the, uh, the smaller versions of the robotic combat vehicle, both in August and then at, during project convergence out at Yuma in September. And so we're on path to start and change how we fight through the employment of robotics in our formations. The MV, or the Armored Multipurpose Vehicle, is our M113 replacement inside our BCTs. Now, when I came in the Army a long time ago as a lieutenant in 84, back into a tank battalion in Germany, we had the 113 and I thought it was old then. But we're finally getting around to replace it with the AMP-V. It's in low rate initial production, and we will field the first set of AMP-Vs to a BCT in FY second quarter of FY22, just over a year from now. Under future vertical lift, we, we remain on pace to field both future long range assault aircraft or FLARA and the future attack reconnaissance aircraft or FARA by FY20. They're on parallel paths and there are myriad complementary capabilities online uh, to include, we have two uh, joint tech uh, multi-role demonstrators that are flying today. And so again, we're on a, uh, on a good path on both programs, but again, it's still a decade away given the, the technolo technology issues that are out there to, to solve. The network continues down a path to field capability sets every two years with the first capability set here in FY21. This is a cross-cutting effort uh, that is key to the success of the future fight, and we resourced it accordingly. We have the most dollars in this CFT, much more than anyone else. And if we don't get, because if we don't get the network right, the efforts in the other CFTs will be suboptimized upon delivery. So there's a lot of focus and energy in this particular area. In the air and missile defense area, the Army recently com completed the limited user test or the LUT of the Integrated Air and Missile Defense uh, Battle Command System, uh, or also known as IBCS. IBS, uh, during the LUT, it combined the inputs of both Patriot and Sentinel radars uh, for, missile, for miss, uh, missile fire control, and actually under the test, they intercepted the ballistic and cruise missile targets. So the Army will field uh, the 1st Patriot Battalion with IBCS next year, and we'll head into IOT&E for certification in 22. In the same area, the Patriot rate, uh, radar replacement uh, is underway with the uh, LTAMS, lower tier uh, air and missile defense sensor. Again, it'll replace a very expensive uh, to maintain radar that we have in the system right now that can't sense out uh, as deep as our missiles can shoot. So LTAMS is gonna fill that gap 
and we're on we're at a decision uh, expected decision in fourth quarter of 22 on urgent material release and we'll field the first unit in december of 22. also in this area we have mobile shore ad or, man, or maneuver shore ad uh, like yeah short range uh, air defense uh, system uh, army will begin fielding increment one which is in, 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 in in, integrates uh, air defense capability onto a striker platform, and that'll hit the field or with our first battalion fielded in FY22. Also in air missile defense, the IFPIC interim solution is now in our hands. The first Iron Dome battery was delivered uh, from Israel and arrived in White Sands missile range uh, earlier this month. We'll re receive the second battery in February of 21. So both these batteries will become initially become IOC, Later this year, by the end of this year, we'll have both of them, at, or end of, I should say, 21, they'll both be IOC. And we're working toward an enduring, uh, working toward an enduring IFPIC solution by the end of FY21 after a shoot off that we'll have in the summer of 21. Finally, in this area, RICTO is also working on directed energy and other alternatives in the AMD arena talking about lasers and other kind of capabilities to counter the threats we're very concerned about. I won't talk the details here, but we're on a positive path. In fact, Lieutenant General Thurgood just briefed the secretary on where we're at yesterday, and I was a part of that, and it was a very good brief. Under soldier lethality, you may have heard of IBAS, or Integrated Visual Augmentation System. Again, on another, another program that's on a very good path, we just completed the third soldier touch point about a month ago. Uh, it was uh, with actually a battalion. It was 600 systems with actually the actually military form factor systems this time. We've had kind of Game Boy looking systems or something, but these were actually the first versions that were under military form factor used by our soldiers. This system or capability stands to revolutionary, re revolutionize how we fight where it matters most. At the squad and platoon levels where the fight is unfortunately the fairest, it's just you can't make it an uneven fight at that level, and the casualties are the greatest. But we're on glide path for a rapid fielding decision in the next month or so, and we're set for initial or uh, the IOT&E in April of 21. Also, we're uh, on a good path on next generation squad weapon, both the rifle and the automatic rifle. Uh, we completed the prototype test recently, and we believe we'll begin fielding in fourth quarter of FY22 to replace the saw and the M4 in our close combat formations around the Army. Finally, uh, the assured position navigation and timing in synthetic training environment CFTs are both uh, heading in a great direction. These are cross-cutting capabilities that ensure the Army can communicate un in a contested environment and will also overhaul the way we train in our soldiers in the future. So that's where we stand on the next generation capability that we put all those billions of dollars against to develop them and then feel them. And when I sat here in 2018 and talked about those same capabilities, I didn't know what I was talking about. And it seemed like it was way in the future, way out there in 22 and three and four. Now it's right over the horizon. And with the, with the exception of OMFB, which we reset a little bit, all of them are on the same exact path that we talked about a couple of years ago when I was here as a, the G8. It's not all about the deep future, though, or the next generation capabilities. The Army has to have the capability to fight tonight on the interim, and we've aligned the resources to do just that. For example, our strategy remains to modernize the Armored Brigade combat teams at the rate of one ABCT a year. This includes investments in the SEP V3 tank, the Bradley A4, the Paladin Integrated Management, or PIM, Amp V, and Hercules A3s. We were made committed to upgrading the striker formations with DVHA1 and continue to add myriad lethality upgrades to that platform. And in our IBCTs, we were continued to make them more lethal, mobile, and survivable with the fielding of the small equipment transport or SMET. Uh, the infantry squad vehicle is being fielded right now and cutting, you know, cutting edge small UAVs to both platoon and squad level. And the mobile perfected firepower is still on a good path. Uh, so, th and, and then the other I, uh, I, you know, soldier lately the uh, programs I talked about, IVIS and next gen squad weapon are critical to those formations. We continue to update our rotary wing formations, uh, our fleets, uh, the combat aviation brigades, 
and both the active and National Guard are fielding roughly two battalions of H-64E models per year over the next six years. We're resourced for that. We also are fielding the Mike model Blackhawk at about one battalion a year for both the active component and the National Guard. And also we will begin fielding the first uh, Victor model Blackhawks uh, to the National Guard in the near future. So to the budget outlook, got to get a sip of water here. Uh, as we look into the crystal ball from this point forward, it gets a little bit fuzzy. I alluded to that a bit earlier uh, where we stand in uh, PB21 and up on the hill and in Palm 22 that's still inside the Pentagon. There's a lot of swirl going on. But as we look forward, we wanted to get some insights of where we think we'll be on the future. So last April and May, when we were on the front end of COVID and we saw what was going on out there with the outlays of the three trillion, et cetera, Major General Carl Gingrich and I, and Carl's the Army programmer, we called around to several think tanks, talked to highly regarded people in those think tanks and also an Ivy League economist, all with deep knowledge of the DOD budgets over time. And we asked them their thoughts on the future DOD top line, given the, impact, given the impacts of COVID was having on our economy and the associate outlays I talked about from Congress. And there were two schools of thought. And I shared some of these with our industry partners when we met uh, during AUSA. So uh, it's gonna be what you heard a little bit, uh, just a little bit ago. The minority opinion uh, that we weren't talking to those experts was that the U.S. economy or the U.S., we've become very comfortable with deficit spending. So DOD, we could see only a, perhaps a minor top line hit. And under that scenario, the Army leadership would not have to make any real tough choices. We could essentially head down the same path we've been on, slow growth, continuing to fully modernize uh, while also remaining highly ready. The majority opinion, however, was that the, the Department of Defense should be preparing for a significant top line reduction, regardless of who wins the election. Again, this was back in April and May. Uh, this was based on the anticipated uh, reduction in tax revenue based in, combined with the increase in government spending as a result of COVID that would result in a decision to pull back the levers on spending. And under this scenario, uh, it would drive tough decisions by the Army leadership, leadership on how to meet a lower top line. And so I'll put one slide up here. And it's time for just a quick tutorial on the levers in play as we look at building an Army program. Uh, the Army develops a five-year program by applying senior leadership priorities on end strength, readiness, and modernization. And under a steady top line from year to year, these gears are interconnected, as you can see on the left of the slide. Uh, they're not independent under a steady state uh, top line. If you wanna grow Army end strength from year to year under a steady top line, and you turn that dial, you have to turn down the readiness and modernization fund, uh, dials to fund that, top, that uh, growth in end strength. But if and when there is a significant top line adjustment, either up or down, the gears get pulled apart and you can turn one hard to meet the top line to protect the other two, or you can turn all three down to meet a top line adjustment based on the strategic guidance of the leadership. All right, take the, you can take the slide down there now. Since the end of the Cold War, when the Army has been faced with a significant downturn in top line, the easy button has been modernization. We turned down modernization, the, the modernization dial or gear in order to preserve end strength. And whatever was left over after that, we put into readiness to ensure we had the ability to fight tonight. In short, we took a modernization holiday. It's easy to do, to defer the future readiness of the Army to protect the current state of the Army and let somebody else worry about the future readiness. It's kind of like uh, my kids when they were in the house, you know, you offer them $10, you want $10 today or $50 in the future, the value of money over time, they'll always take the $10 a day, even though they write really need that $50 in the future. Often that's the decisions we made. We worried about the here and now and not the future. And we turned, we took that modernization holiday. I believe it's gonna be different this time around if and when we receive a significant top line reduction. And again, there's no, I don't know if it's gonna happen. These are the experts talking to us, but if it does happen, I do think it will be different. 
Both the secretary and the chief have stated that we must modernize the army. It's a once in every 40 year opportunity and it's against a valid requirement. Russia and China aren't going anywhere. Our NDS has us focused on them. In fact, we believe they'll continue to be going in the wrong direction. The equipment we have today is not what we need to deter, and if deterrence fails, to fight and win against high-end adversaries in the future. I believe we'll look at continuing to fully resource selected CFT efforts that are deemed especially critical, even under a significant top-line reduction. Those, criticals, those uh, critical programs are as follows. So get ready to copy. Okay, listen, I'm not a dummy. I'm not stupid here, and I want to be able to retire on schedule. So I'm going to not share that with you, and I don't even really know it myself. Uh, General Murray will be intimately, personally involved in that if it gets to that point with the Army leadership. I'm the guy that has some thoughts and recommendations who would adjust the resources in response to those decisions. In short, I don't believe the Army leadership will hit the easy button this time around. Modernization will be protected to a degree as we balance the program under a top-line adjustment downward if that happens. So to wrap this up, that's where the Army's been in the last few years. Where we are today as we sit here in November of 2020 and where I think we may go in the future. We're in a good place today, but tough choices may lie ahead. But our leadership is ready to make those choices to ensure our soldiers have the equipment they need in the future to fight and win. So thanks for your time today. I'll be glad to take any questions you have. And I don't, if I don't have a good answer at my fingertips, what I'll do is I'll take one for the record and I'll get it back to you through whatever means is available there. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll read the question and try to answer it. Um, the first one, let's see. Yeah, let me take the glasses off. They, so it says, uh, since the big five programs of the 80s, the Army does not have a great track record of delivering new equipment other than incremental upgrades to the big five. The Army, the Army has talked about in inflection points before. Why is this period any different? Wow, great question. We throw around inflection point a lot, I've noticed. In fact, I looked that up in the dictionary once to see what it was to make sure I understood it. Uh, it's interesting. Well, I would say um, on that point, uh, there was a book I was in Sam's once upon a time, stayed a second year, because why would you leave Leavenworth early if you didn't have to go jump into the rat race of being a major out there? But uh, we had to read some book in Sam's about how do you in implement like cultural, radical, fundamental change in institutions, and it's really hard. It takes everybody realizing that there's a no kidding existential crisis out there. Um, and we're, you're trying to avoid that epiphany out there that you wake up one day and you realize uh, you're, in a, you're in a bad place. Um, I think the national defense strategy, I don't know if that woke everybody up. There, there was a lot of agreement. It was spot on. Uh, regardless of who you talk to up on the hill or you know, with industry or most anybody that read it out there in think tanks, uh, it resonated. It made sense. Uh, we were overly overcommitted for too long in Iraq and Afghanistan. And at the same time, Russia and China were doing things that uh, were getting out in front of us in some areas. And I think it woke everybody up. I don't know if it's woken everybody up to the degree that will stay, that will stay committed moving forward. My hope that it will. I was just talking with Guy. There will be a new NDS out sometime soon, whether, whether we change administrations or not. It's time to do one. But I think it will still look at high-end uh, adversaries out there is what we need to focus on in the future. So I think uh, we're going to, because of our commitment to the NDS and the commitment of our leadership that I just talked about before, that even in the tough times, we're going to have to modernize. I think it'll be different. I think we do have a bad track record, but we're on a path to see these through. We're going to, and I think we're going to actually deliver this time the other factor that's different now is we have Futures Command. We didn't have that in the point. The, our ability to modernize was trifurcated, not bifurcated. It was all over the place, led by a bunch of different folks. Now it's one four-star that is out there that's that's in, in charge of it. And so, again, that's another reason why it's going to be different this time. All right. Um, 
I guess the next one is, do you think Army processes are flexible enough to move beyond incremental change to transformational change? Hmm. Another good one. I, I think it's a, a struggle, personally. Um, it's amazing how hard it, it gets back to the first question a little bit to have fundamental change on process in something like the Pentagon, especially is really hard. I, I think the army, the military were, I've always said this, we're fundamentally conservative and that's not in the political sense of, you know, uh, liberal conservative. It's in the conservative and we abhor change. We love what we know or are comfortable with. And to try and change things is a struggle. I do think, though, uh, I'll go back to Futures Command. I think what General Murray's doing on how we've changed the requirements process that I've seen in my short period of time here that's taken the approval of a requirement from years to, uh, you know, to a single year is one part of the process that's changed fundamentally. I also think, I think it's the power of putting a four-star you know, Pat's here, guys here. I thought being a three star, you had a lot of juice. You could make the world, you could do anything you wanted. Now that I am one, I realize I don't have any juice at all. The four stars make all the decisions and they're the ones. And now that we put a four star uh, that's a commander in charge of the future of the army, he's breaking through a lot of those barriers that we couldn't in the past. He's breaking rice bowls. A lot of people aren't, some people aren't happy with what's happening, but I think we're doing exactly the right thing. And because we have General Murray promoted, in that job over the last couple of years, it's getting us to where we need to be. Okay. The commission that reviewed uh, the NDS recommended annual budget increases of three to 5% for DOD. But with the FY21 budget and what many are expecting for future budgets, given the budget constraint and strained environment, it does not appear that the commission's recommendations will be realized, at least for the next year or so. Has OSD started to review the national defense strategy considering a more constrained budget environment? Well, I heard it was gonna be rewritten regardless of who won the election. The next administration was gonna to have to take a look at it. It starts to get stale after three years. Uh, that's what it would have been. Um, yeah, that's, it was in, we haven't had three to 5% real growth uh, over the, I was just talking with Guy before we started on this. Uh, we were, we've been well resourced, uh, not in alignment with the guidance of the NDS, but uh, there was not a lot of complaints, at least on my end, for the dollars we were getting. Um, and we were not putting our hand out. I'll just go a little bit off the question. I think I, if I could go back to that other question, the reason I think we're going to see it through this time uh, on delivering as a par compared to the big five, so I'm dancing here a little bit on the question, is we had the deep dives. We found the dollars inside the Army, and we moved them against those priorities, that next generation capability. In the past, we developed a concept. We said, here's what we need, and then we went down the hall to OSD and Congress and said, we need the money for it. And it often failed when we didn't make a good argument or there are other priorities for those dollars. So the fact that we found the money inside the, inside the Army to resource our priorities is another reason why I think it's going to be seen through. So yeah, the NDS is going to have to be rewritten. Uh, the pen will have to be put to paper on that. It'll have to take into account the current environment. I think the underpinnings at its core are sound, but they're going to have to take a look at uh, the fiscal environment and the adjustments, I think, that are have to make to the NDS, because if it's if it's a strategy without the resources aligned, it's it's not worth the paper it's on. So we're going to have to, I, I think it's a good question, and the, the next folks that produce that are going to have to put, take that all into account. Okay, can you speak to the process change to the how the Army develops requirements and the new relationships between G3, G8, AFC? Well, I don't know if it got out in public, but I know the Vice sent out a note to all the GOs in the Army yesterday, or maybe the whole Army. It just got released yesterday, the 17th, today's the 18th, I think, right? So yeah, it came out the 17th of November. It was this uh, study that was done on Army Futures Command one year after they were FOC. And it realigned, took a look at how we were doing things on requirements and the relationship with, uh, uh, with acquisition, et cetera. And it, it uh, took a kind of a blank sheet look at that, and it, and it kind of addressed some of the issues, the friction areas, the problems we were having on .mil PF integration and some other things. And uh, it got signed out uh, just by the, by the secretary, uh, again, just uh, within the last week. 
So it's out there now. I think it addresses some problems I've seen as the G8. Uh, and so I'm very excited about what got put in there. We're actually codifying that in our AR, the Army regulation that I oversee to make sure it's actually survives personalities when they move that's actually in a regulation. With regard to the requirements process, uh, yeah, it was a rough start when we pulled together AFC and uh, but I, we are where we need to be. Uh, the process now, I won't belabor this with everybody, it is smoothed out. And really we have a system where we, we pull requirements that we want rather than here's a requirement that bubbles up from the field for the, the bayonet, the next bayonet we need that's going to be longer, sharper and stuff because it's gone through the staffing and it's a, you know, every, they want it down there, but it's not something we next generation. Now General Murray is pulling forward requirements that we need to keep it on pace for delivery when we have to have it. Additionally, we've, we've implemented a process where we have what's called an abbreviated CDD which doesn't have hard characteristic or requirements in it, like uh, KPPs and KSAs for you guys that know what I'm talking about out there. That's very restrictive. If you don't meet it under the threshold, then you know you fail the test. We are creating, uh, we've created this abbreviated CDD that has characteristics that, and so our, part of this is something that we, we learned some things from the OMFV experience is we try to have very detailed hard requirements too early. And we needed to have broad characteristics to see what was possible and then also enable uh, industry to come along with this to show us what's possible. Over time, we will then adjust the document and then lock in the requirement once it's proven that we could attain it. So those are some of the, uh, and that was General Murray pulled that together. So I'm very happy with the relationship now. I think we're at a good operating temperature and we continue to be self-critical and we, we have to adjust on the margins as we move forward. Okay. Oh. The Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, Space Force, Special Operations and Defense Agencies develop new capabilities in support of joint all domain operations. Uh, are there any particular technologies or capabilities that overlap with the other services, but the Army has a special strength or development breakthrough that you can share with us? Um, I don't know if I'll, well, the question triggered something I should probably talk about is this JADC2 concept that's gained a lot of momentum over the last six months or so. And really it was the outgoing vice chairman uh, when he left uh, the office uh, last summer. Uh, his departing kind of gift is we got to pull this JADC2, how we're going to close the kill chain um, and have the ability to network sensors, shooters, and command post across joint lines so that you go down from, uh, you know, at the National Training Center, even in combat when I was there, takes 20 minutes from the, just inside a little BCT or whatever to send a fire mission to get rounds on the objective. For whatever reason, a lot of things in the middle of that. But through AI and uh, machine learning, et cetera, and breaking through the flow of data, that is really a lot of the times the problems we have, uh, even between Army systems, to bring that kill chain down to you're talking a minute or less. And we demonstrated that at Project Convergence just back in September. Uh, with, and that was jointly done. And we had a Marine Corps F-35 that played out there. And we were passing data between the Marine Corps to Army platforms and shooting in a minute or two when would have taken 20 minutes again or more in the past. So that's where we're going. We think whoever decides and shoots first is going to win in the future. And that's the direction we're heading. Um, the actual, the other capabilities that what is the Army really good at that others aren't? A lot of things. Based on the complexity on the ground, our requirements on the ground are much different than the air and on the maritime environment. And we are, we're working together to make sure those requirements are uh, input into the system on the front end. So let me leave it at that. Can you share any details on Project Convergence 21? Will WISMER be the center of gravity? Um, I don't know about the center of gravity. Jim Richardson, Lieutenant General Jim Richardson out there at AFC, he's the deputy out there for General uh, Murray. He is the center of, you know, he's the smart guy on where we're going on Project 21. So I'll defer that in the future on where we're going. I know in 21, it's going to be a big effort to go joint. So it was really mostly inside the Army for Project Convergence out at Yuma, Arizona. 
And then 21 is going to be really a focus on bringing our joint partners in. I was at an Army Air Force staff talks with the new Army Chief of Staff and General McConville a couple of months ago now. Great outcome. They both were of like mind. We've got to bring our systems together, make sure the data is flowing, all those kind of things. And if the Army and the Air Force can figure it out, we think we can bring the other folks along. And there was a commitment to work really hard between now and 21, uh, PC 21, to bring all our toys together and make them work. And then in 22, looking deeper, we want to get to bring our coalition, really our closest allies in. So it's C, JAD, C2, combined with our, you know, the Brits and the Australians and maybe some others that we work with a lot and are kind of at our level of operating. And so we're, that's the path forward. I don't know if Wisdom is going to be the center of gravity if we'll con continue to go to Yuma, but I'll defer that to General Richards and he has the answer on that. How does the Army plan to balance advanced technology R&D early stage versus acquisition dollars over the next few years? And if top line budget is hit and affects modernization, would that hit R&D before acquisition? Good question. Uh, part of that uh, memo that just came out I talked about addressed S&T dollars. You're talking about early R&D, or uh, I think you're talking about maybe S&T. And so, okay, good. Um, so some of that is uh, in that budget, because there was some friction and a little bit of overlap that I think got clarified in the memo that just came out. But uh, there's also, I think some, you know, and in the S&T pot, the floor is the ceiling. We keep it there all the time. We don't think you should accept uh, risk in S&T and looking at that early development on things we need in the future. So even when we bring it down, we keep the, keep the S&T the same, I guess as a percentage as the budgets would come down or the top line come down, our S&T percentage would probably go up because we're gonna leave that the same. Um, all right, it's a last question, or was that the last question? Why, well, one more, okay. I guess, uh, can you talk to the method that, is that one there? Okay, can you talk to the method that the Army intends to use to field the new modernized capabilities the Army is developing like IRCA cannon or IVAS? Will the Army's strategy to, what will be the, okay, another great question. Wow, you hit, tossed me a softball here to help out the G3. We're in the middle, and, and General Flynn rolled this out in a couple places, but uh, we're in the middle of developing a new operating model right now. It's not, we don't have the bow on it, uh, but he's talked to the staffers on the Hill, and uh, I won't get out in front of the G3 too much. But we're looking to provide some predictability for our soldiers, and uh, frankly, to give them a little bit of a break. as uh, uh, They are getting run hard. And we're not deploying folks like we did in the past, but we just love to train out there. And I understand it. I've been in that world a lot. But the chief's getting indicators that we're really running our soldiers hard and they need a break. So part of this operating model is to give our soldiers a little bit of a break, slow down the pace, uh, keep our army highly ready, but do it smartly. Part of that new operating model will have modernization windows where that unit will be just focused on getting that all that equipment we've been talking about. And then there'll be other cycles like for training and then mission and stuff, but I, I won't get into the details, but it's a cycle. It, if you blur your eyes, it could kind of look like R4 Gen, but it's really focused on uh, being able to modernize the army, have a focused train up period, you do something after that, but really giving it that predictability to our soldiers, give them a break. As a guy mentioned, I got two kids in the army, uh, both in combat arms units, and they're not deploying anywhere, but they are running hard. And uh, I, so I get, you know, those first hand indicators and they're not complaining. They're just telling me what they're doing. I'm not hearing whining, but uh, they are running pretty hard. And so I think uh, the chief's got something out there. You know, people is his number one priority. He gets first hand indicators too from kids in the army that he has. So I think it'll have some second and third order effects we're trying to have on the army with uh, that we're seeing on things like suicides and other things that we need to address in the Army. So I think it'll have the po a lot, so many good second and third order effects once we get this new operating system that General Flynn is leading for us, and he's got to get it up and actually finalized uh, with our leadership. Okay, listen, uh, I appreciate your time. I think I'm getting the hook here. I'm going to turn it back to Guy. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, thanks again. Well, thank you, General Pascaret, for those insights. Uh, and, and more importantly, thanks for your support of AUSA. We, 
General Pascaret has never turned down an invitation to come and speak at our forums and different events. Um, and I would also ask, Jim, as you go back to the Pentagon, um, new leadership team coming in in January. Uh, you mentioned uh, that and educating that new team about what the Army's done and all the things you talked about today. Convey back to your colleagues that we are a conduit for that message uh, and use us at AUSA to, to get that message out. So thank you very much. Before we uh, depart, I wanted to bring you up to date on some upcoming events here at AUSA. Tomorrow, uh, the 19th of November, we hope you can join us for our next AUSA Thought Leaders webinar with noted author, historian, and television personality, uh, Mr. James Holland. Mr. Holland has just published a new book on World War II entitled Sicily 43, The First Assault on Fortress Europe. And then next Tuesday, uh, 24th of November, we'll host another AUSA Thought Leaders webinar, this time a, a fascinating event, I hope you can join us, which will feature General Thierry Burkhardt, the Chief of Staff of the French Army, and Major General Michel de Leon, who is the Director of the French Army Doctrine and Staff College Command. And they'll be discussing the new French Army strategic vision and how it meshes with many of the things that General Pascaret talked about today. And then on the 2nd of November, please join us for another AUSA noon report with Command Sergeant Major John Sampa. Sergeant Major Sampa is the Command Sergeant Major of the Army National Guard. Register for all of these events and all AUSA events by going to the AUSA website at ausa.org slash meet. We want to thank all of you who are AUSA members for your membership. Membership really counts. Through your membership, you help soldiers, civilians, and families, and the many programs that we bring to you here at AUSA, like today's noon report. Take another look at our robust list of member benefits. Membership pays for itself in a short period of time. And if you use your, uh, use, uh, go to the website, and uh, renew your membership or update your member information again at ausa.org. And then finally, thank you to our sponsor today, Vectris. We appreciate your support and look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us and have a great Army Day.